Thank you to everyone that's joined us this evening for our final event of Saturday, um, HisFest. It's um, gone really fast, but there's been so many interesting and amazing talks, some brilliant questions as well. So thank you to everyone in the audience here from HisFest and also from the British Library as well. And thank you to everyone joining online too. Um, it's been... It's been a really nice day. Um, our final event, which we've shamelessly um, kind of contracted the title of from Lindsay's book, we've called it The Facemaker Mending the Disfigured Soldiers of World War I, when actually the real title is The Facemaker, A Visionary Surgeon's Battle to Mend the Disfigured Soldiers of World War I. I think actually in oh. Britain we changed it to One Surgeon's. Okay. I, the, subtitles are a nightmare, but yes. So, <laughs> a, a surgeon mended. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, I just need to give a little bit of housekeeping again, um, as I have done with the previous events. So if you have questions for, for um, our speakers, that's great. You can ask those questions towards the end of the event, and you can do that by raising your hand if you're in the room here. Um, and we'll get a mic to you. If you're at home, you can ask those questions by putting the question in the question box that's provided. Books are on sale outside. Blackwells have the, uh, the face maker with the uncertain subtitle out there. <laughs> um, and if you're watching online, you can also purchase books via the link. Um, we have speech-to-text captioning that you can use if needed and also BSL interpretation as well. One thing that I just need to flag at the very beginning of this talk is that um, we're asking for no photographs to be taken um, because some of the images... Um, well, Lindsay can explain. Um, I saw... I, that's OK, as long as there's not the photos of the soldiers. The, you can take a photo <laughs> now. If you want to take a photo now, yeah. you can. Um, so I'll introduce the speakers. So chairing the event is Dr. Jen Warren. Jen is a consultant in intensive care and anesthesia, um, a Royal Army Medical Corps veteran and an Invictus Games medalist. She joined the army during medical school and after a tour of Afghanistan, she started anesthetic training. Uh, when a skiing accident left her with limited mobility, Jen was medically discharged but fought to continue her medical training, finally qualifying as a consultant in 2022. And she'll be talking to Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. And Lindsay Fitzharris is the author of The Butchering Art, which won the Penn E.O. Wilson Prize for Literary Science Writing and was shortlisted for the Welcome Book Prize and the Wolfson History Prize. She received her doctorate in history of science, medicine, and technology at the University of Oxford and was a postdoctoral, sorry, postdoctoral research fellow at the Wellcome Institute. She contributes regularly to the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, and other notable publications, but she's here today to talk about the face maker. Thank you. I will hand over to you. Thank you. <laughs> also, as a bit of an icebreaker, I also wrote an article for Penthouse once. Um, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> ruined everybody's day. It was all about history of medicine, and I'm sure people who picked it up were very upset by that. <laughs> oh, wow, I, I didn't find that when I was doing my research. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, well, thank you, everyone, for coming. I I'm really excited to be talking to Lindsay about this book because um, I haven't done a lot because I haven't been very well. And um, uh, but you've brought me out of retirement. You've brought me because <laughs> this book is just absolutely incredible. Thank because you. you know, I think we talk about it as a surgeon, but it's so much more than than just one person, isn't it? Yes, I mean, I I called it the face maker, but if you do end up reading it, it is it's. I really wanted to focus on the disfigured soldiers as well, Gillies' patients. So The Face Maker is about the surgeon Harold Gillies who rebuilt soldiers' faces during the First World War. And it's an incredible story because there was, he had no textbooks. There was, there was really nobody to teach him how to do this. And I always say that this was a time when losing a limb made you a hero, but losing a face made you a monster to a society that was largely intolerant of facial differences at this time. So this was a very isolating uh, injury. And uh, what Gillies was able to do was really to give these men their dignity back. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think what's amazing about the book is that uh, certainly for me reading it it wasn't just about these soldiers but it was about the way you you write about the sounds the smells 
the experience of the trenches is just really jaw-dropping. Yeah. You know, I, how, how did you... I don't pull any you know, punches, do no, I? No, <laughs> no. I, mean, uh, I really felt like I was there and I could understand what these people were going through. I mean, that's amazing to hear as a writer. Um, I, I didn't know much when I started to write The Facemaker. It wasn't a book I intended to write as my second book. I had actually pitched an entirely different book. Um, and my publisher wasn't convinced that that was the right book. So they said, well, what else do you have? And I panicked and I said, well, there's this surgeon, Harold Gillies, who was rebuilding faces in the First World War. It feels like this is an epic war narrative that needs to be told in a bigger way. And they said, that's it, that's the book. And then I thought, oh my gosh, now I have to write this book. And I, and I knew virtually nothing about the First World War. I mean, I really, you can tell I'm American. I've lived here for 22 years. They couldn't beat this American Chicago accent out of me at Oxford. They tried, um, but it's, it's here to stay. But um, it, it, in America, we don't spend a lot of time learning about the First World War. So I really, it wasn't something I was very familiar with. Um, and, but there was one thing I knew, and that was that I wanted to drop the reader right into the middle of the battlefield from page one. I wanted the reader to feel what that was like to be in the trenches and to sustain a facial injury. So in order to do that, I needed to find my soldier. Unfortunately, a lot of these men did not write extensively about their experiences. Um, it was too painful or, or, or they just didn't write about it. Um, in the way that would help me put together the narrative. So I was very lucky to find the diary of, of Private Percy Clare who opens the story. He's injured in 1917, so that created a bit of a problem as a writer because I had to then dial the clock back in the first, so he opens in the prologue, so then in chapter one we go to right before the war begins. But I wanted to use his diary to reconstruct what that was like, because he writes so beautifully and vividly about this experience. And he talks about the bullet going through his face and laying on the battlefield um, for hours, really, until the stretcher bearers came and picked him up, and eventually getting off the battlefield and then getting sent to the wrong hospital and so forth and so on. So the challenges were immense not just surviving, but getting into the hands of Harold Gillies, who had opened up a specialty unit at the beginning of the war. So it was, it was very lucky if you were able to get into Gillies' care. Um, so I took Percy Clare's uh, diary. Unfortunately, Percy Clare, uh, there's no case photos of him, because a lot of Gillies' case photos were destroyed in the Second World War uh, when London was bombed. So these, these men kind of you know, faced another indignity when a lot of these case notes then um, were destroyed. So I got in contact with a family member of his and I said, do you have any photos of him? And she said, well, we have a, a, a photo album and uh, it's you know one of those photo albums with the plastic cover, but we had a flood, <laughs> which is what every historian dreads. <laughs> and I thought, oh gosh, so she sent me the entire album, the photos, you couldn't pull them out because they were stuck in this plastic and I had, um, uh, a, a really uh, great guy named Jordan who, who colorizes and restores photos. He actually restored the photos of Percy Clare. But these are photos of him later in life. And you really can't tell. I mean, he, Gillies did an extraordinary job on his face. Yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely incredible all the, the, story, the way in which this, this book, you know, your book, writes about not just the Harold Gillies, but it, it's almost Harold Gillies through the eyes of the people around him, you know, his patients. Yeah, um, yeah. And you, you, you find all these stories, but you understand what they went through, because I think at that time, right. as you mentioned, facial disfigurement was, um, well, certainly on the kind of war pension side of things, you went directly to the highest level of injury yeah. um, and the highest level of benefit if you had a facial injury, even if the rest of your body was working out. That's right. Fine. I mean, it was seen as the fate worse than death, which was... It, so at the beginning of the war, there were an incredible number of advances in weaponry. There were so many advances that a company of just 300 men in 1914 could deploy equivalent firepower as a 60,000 strong army during the Napoleonic Wars. So these men were entering the situation with no real training and no real gear to protect them. Um, there were flamethrowers that belched forth fire that destroyed everything. There were uh, tanks for the very first time, and these presented new kinds of injuries. And of course, there were chemical weapons. Even as gas masks were being rushed to the front, these lethal gas attacks became instantly synonymous with the savagery of the First World War. Men were burned, they were maimed. Some were even kicked in the face by horses. So there were 
a lot of these injuries. Before the war was over, 280,000 men from France, Britain, and Germany alone suffered some form of facial trauma. So there was this incredible need for uh, facial reconstruction. But it was very isolating, and it was seen as a fate worse than death. In fact, during the Napoleonic Wars, sometimes French combatants who were disfigured were purposely killed by their own comrades to save them from what they thought was the fate worse than death. I mean, this was horrible. And this is, this is well and alive on the eve of the First World War. And a lot of it, I go into the book, I talk about you know, some of it's associated with old biases about social diseases such as syphilis, um, where there is disfigurement that comes with that disease. There were certain crimes that came with purposeful disfigurement. Your nose might be cut off for certain crime. Um, so that, that was kind of ingrained in society. And I think that, you know, I mean, Jen and I talked a little bit before. We, we had a great phone call a couple days ago, and I said, they're going to have to shut us up on stage. <laughs> but, you know, we, we were talking. I mean, I, I would still say that there are still a lot of barriers that we have to overcome. And you're, in your experience, too, you're saying that when you talk to patients on the phone and then seeing Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm working as a doctor, and um, I've been a wheelchair user for about the last 15 years. Um, and it is incredible you um, have a conversation with um, somebody on the phone, you give them some sensible advice, and then you say, yeah, I'm going to come and see the patient. You turn up to see the patient, sometimes in the middle of the night, and somebody says, oh, my goodness, are you OK? Right. You know? and I was like, yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm, I, last time I checked, I was yeah. all right. You know, <laughs> I've just got a different way of getting around the world. Um, you know, and, and, and sometimes I've genuinely wished that I could be slightly invisible um, because of the, the, the impact the first impressions people have when they see me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think all I'm using is I'm using my body, what I've got, to the best of my ability. And, right, you know, yeah. I think this is where I find it so sad is, is in, in some of these mm -hmm. stories, you know, it's a, um, they've got a facial disfigurement um, and then they, they, they live their life with this, but the rest of their body's working fine. Right, I mean, and, and that's why them getting the full pension, it's good that the army was taking care of them, but arguably having a disfigurement doesn't mean that you can't work, but it was seen societal, you know, society saw this as like, the worst of the worst, like you would have to hide away. Um, and in fact, when Gilly's patients, he eventually, he started a specialty unit at the Cambridge Military Hospital in Aldershot. Eventually, he was so overwhelmed that he opened an entire hospital called the Queen's Hospital in Sidcup. It still exists. And um, he, uh, oh, I've just lost my train of thought. I was going to be talking about the hospital. In oh, yes. Yeah. When, when his patients left the hospital grounds, um, they were forced to sit on brightly painted blue benches around the village so that the public knew not to look at them because it might upset them. And so it was very isolating when you mm -hmm. think about it. And um, it, so, it, what, again, what he was able to do, I mean, we were talking about how, ironically, what Harold Gillies does is he tries to help these men blend back into society, but as a result, he births you know, modern plastic surgery which has made us all sort of all hyper aware of how we look on, on some level. Yeah, but um, this, this is pre-Instagram though, wasn't it? No, it was pre-Instagram, <laughs> I mean, you know, and it's, it, it was just, it's, it's mind boggling when you think. And so when I went through this process too, I really thought about, you know, what kind of images I wanted to show you as the reader. And I wanted to make sure that the book wasn't medical voyeurism. So I only chose photos of the men who are featured in The Face Maker. You're not going to get a full case, you know. I mean, he worked on hundreds and hundreds, thousands of, of soldiers. You're not going to get the full uh, case notes. You're only going to get those you know, eight men who I really dig into their stories and I feature. And there is an exception. Um, if they died in Gilly's care, I do not include their photos. So there was a pilot named Lumley who crashed his plane on graduation day. He never even made it into the war. And, um, and these, these pilots in the First World War, they used to call themselves um, the, I think it was like the 12-minute club, like the time it took to shoot down one of their planes. I mean, it was absolutely uh, horrendous. And they would go up into these planes with guns, not to shoot at each other, but to shoot themselves if their plane was going down to save themselves from the fate worse than death, the disfigurement and burns that would follow. But Lumley survives the plane crash, and he's terribly burned. And he is sent to a different hospital, and he spends about a year there. And, and during this time, his skin hardens, and you can imagine what's happening to the burns. And he's in really bad shape when he gets to Gilly's hospital. 
and Gillies decides he's going to try to reconstruct the face by lifting a flap of skin from the chest and moving it to the face. But he tells Lumley he doesn't want to operate yet because Lumley is, is not in good shape. And Lumley begs him to do it because he's in so much pain, he's addicted to morphine, he's upset with how he looks, and he wants this done. And so Gillies gives in. And what happens is Lumley ends up dying as a result. Now this is a really sad, personal story, and it's important to recognize failure, especially when you're talking about something like the birth of modern plastic surgery. But it also is, it's important to tell because it taught Gillies a really important lesson, which is that when you're rebuilding the face, you have to do it in piecemeal. You can't do it all at once. It will kill or overwhelm the body. And, um, and he, he's, he had this maxim, you know, never do today what you can reasonably put off to do tomorrow. Um, something that I definitely live by well, I, as well. I, yeah. so. <laughs> I, I also think it's true in modern medicine. You know, right. we've, we've, particularly in trauma surgery and things, we've learned that actually damage control is much better than trying to do a perfect job right. um, first yeah. off. So, you know, yeah. he was actually way before his time yeah. um, when he was um, at the advocating for that. I mean, kind slowing of, um, down is, is sometimes a hard thing to do because yeah. you want to. And of course, you know, surgeons, I don't know how many people in the audience are medically trained or if there are any surgeons surgeons in the audience, but if there are any surgeons, you are a particular kind of breed, you know, you, you want the challenge, you know, and there was an element of that with Gillies, you know, he was competitive, and when he opened his hospital, they had different units, and each unit was headed, like, you had the New Zealand unit, you had the Australian unit, and what happened was all these surgeons were very competitive, and so the standards sort of rose across the board, because they were all sort of competing with each other, you know, who could do the best reconstructive surgery. Um, so there's, there is an element in, in the face maker, certainly, where Gillies is trying to push the envelope because he wants to do that for the discipline. He wants to understand you know, what surgeons can do, but as a result, his patients suffer sometimes. And that is a really important part, I think, of the history of medicine, and it's an important part to share in this story. I in feel particular. I have to talk about being an anaesthetist. Yes. You cannot talk about <laughs> yes. a surgeon without an, being right. an anaesthetist. Oh then, my gosh. You know, I think uh, it's The most it's underrated also... <laughs> person. And I was telling Jen, I used to uh, be a secretary for the anesthesiologist in Chicago, and I had a patient come in once, and I said, the, the doctor will be with you shortly. And they said, I'm not here to see a doctor. <laughs> and I said, well, you better hope that's a yeah. doctor <laughs> anesthetizing you. You are very underrated, but you're the most important person in the operating room. I mean, I, I'm just in awe of the anesthetist of the time, though, because um, certainly when you're operating on the face, you're dealing with a shared airway. So you're, you're both trying to work in the same space. And these days, we've got the luxury of um, intravenous anesthesia. We've got um, intravenous um, uh, opioids and things like that that we yeah. can give. At that time, they were trying to deal with um, ether and chloroform. Right, know, I, and I, it was <laughs> literally a mask over the face. So anesthesia hadn't really progressed since the 1840s, since ether had been discovered. So it's really, and, and the anesthetist didn't exist, really. They were, there was no formal training. So you just had you know, Bob, who they <laughs> pulled off the, the field and said, you know, here, or Jen, yeah. You know, you put, you put it, you know, put this cloth over this guy's face. And so, there, and there was no control over the drugs. Like, they didn't, they couldn't control how much they were administering necessarily. Then it becomes a problem if you're missing parts of your face, how do you anesthetize these men? And there is a, a scene in The Face Maker where Harold Gillies is bent over a patient, you must have loved this, and the patient's breathing ether back into his <laughs> face and he's getting woozy. And this is exactly what you wouldn't want you know, if you were undergoing delicate facial reconstruction. So it was Gillies' anesthetist, Ivan McGill. And did you know about Ivan McGill going into this book? Yeah, because he must be a hero of anesthesia right <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, you know it, it's it's fascinating yeah. how these things are all slightly intertwined and, right you know, and, uh, but it makes sense now doesn't it that anesthesia would have progressed alongside face so what ivan mcgill does is he uh invents intratracheal anesthesia and he you know becomes one of the biggest figures in anesthesia in the 20th century just as gillies did in plastic surgery and these two things came out of the first world war um, so it's amazing. I mean, the First World War was terrible. And I, and I think there's an, an element where people do want to cling to this idea that all these great medical achievements came out of it. But I also remind people that there's certainly truth to that. But 
as these doctors got better at patching these men up, they were sending them back into the trenches. So there's an element that as medicine caught up and got better at this, they were sort of prolonging the war because they were feeding the war machine. And there were certainly cases where Gillies would be operating on these men and his job really was to patch them up and get them back into fighting order. And so some of his patients would undergo you know, long reconstructive surgery and they would just be sent right back out there. And, they, and some of them did, of course, die. So that was a really hard part learning you know, about their stories. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's an important story to tell when you're telling this sort of history of, of, of what's happening at the time. Um, one of the things that really struck me um, was how you describe how Harold Gillies creates this community um, in this hospital. I mean, it's funny actually because um, you first of all described the Cambridge Hospital. Now, um, I joined the army just after the right. Cambridge Hospital was closed, oh, and it's it's yeah. it's funny because for me, it's always been an old building. It's never really yeah. been a place. They're uh, turning it know. into like luxury flats now, or something <laughs> yeah. like really weird. You know, but at the time, yeah. it was, you know, it's yeah. a huge bustling hospital. Um, and then you describe this community that um, is created in Sidcup, and yeah. um, I spent long periods at, at Headley Court um, uh, undergoing rehabilitation rehabilitation there and I know how powerful it was to create that community and right. create it was almost like a little bubble where it allowed me to get better um, but allowed me to sort of take on the challenges a little bit at a time rather than just going out into society struggling and then um, uh, kind of it yeah. gave me that sense of community and, and because everybody was in a wheelchair you said it felt yeah I mean people you know there was a whole variety of different disabilities and um, you know I think it, but that sense of community you weren't really othered because we were all others yeah um, and um, it kind of made you a little bit a little bit stronger and I, I guess it was the same for um, yeah for Billy's and his. yeah I mean I think one of the strengths of the, of the Queen's Hospital certainly was that everybody there was disfigured um, if you had received uh, an injury to the face and you were sent to a different hospital, you might be with other soldiers who had different kinds of injuries, but they didn't have a disfigurement. And you might feel reserved or shy to interact with the community. Gillies also, I mean, the hospital was amazing because they taught classes, um, taught language classes. They really tried to prepare these men for life after the war. Uh, so there really was a sense of community. And he built relationships with his patients. Some of them went on, one of them, uh, Big Bob Seymour, and I have a picture of him, which I'll show you shortly, but he, uh, he went on to be um, a chauffeur for, for Achilles for like the rest of his life. So they really uh, ended up <laughs> respecting each other and they had a, an unusual doctor-patient relationship. Actually, let me see if I can... Uh... I think I'd, I would actually challenge the usual doctor-patient relationship because one of the things that I would say was really powerful, um, certainly in fr fr looking through my lens in which I read the book through, is that... Um, he, he interacts with his patients on a way, on a, in a way that mm. m in modern medicine we don't do so much. So um, he would go and um, have, have, spend the evening yeah. with his patients on the ward, the longer term patients. And I think, um, you know, I He I'm would go in disguise. You know, <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. He was a prankster you know. and he would go in disguise and he would joke around with them and he would go to, you know, so yeah, there was a real... But I, I think it's really powerful how he spends time getting to know the community that he's trying to help. Mm. And I feel sometimes as a doctor with a visible disability um, that I'm not valued for what I bring. You know, I'm seen as a as the person who I can't, can't get through that door or can't, you know, there's, there's some, some sort of negative prefix put on to things that I do whereas actually my experience of a, a severe injury rehabilitation and then I've um, you know I've been unwell recently and I can then bring that to the care that I'm giving to this community you know I work in intensive care and you right. know I think it's really powerful that I'm able to understand um, what it's like to be different what it's like to not be able to look the way that I want to look or, you know, right. those kind yeah. of things. And I, I think that's Harold Gillies does this in a, in a really incredible way. And, you know, I think sometimes that the value of that is, is, is seen as, well, it's not truly valued. Yeah. Um, and I, and I mean, he, he was unique in the sense he had a, he had a great sense of humor and he did, he could see beyond the injuries, which a lot of, I mean, when I start to show some of the images, you will be, 
probably surprised at how severe these injuries were. I just want to say this, this <laughs> I have to show this whenever I talk about this book. Um, there's a guy named Charles Vladier. He's a French-American dentist, and he's bigger than life, and he is very wealthy, and he has this Rolls Royce. This is his actual Rolls Royce that went up for auction in 2014. And he retrofitted it with a dental chair and he literally drove it to the front under a hail of bullets. Like this guy was, World War I was crazy. People, you know, it's, I think, you know, sometimes people say, oh, they were more patriotic. I think they were a little bit more naive about what <laughs> was about to happen. Um, I remember reading a story about a, a boy, you couldn't even really call him a man, who went to enlist and they said, would you like to stay in the army for a year or until the end of the war. And he thought, well, I don't want to stay in the army for a year. I'll just stay till the end of the war. <laughs> so, I mean, they really didn't know. And so Charles Vladier, with his Rolls Royce and his dental chair, recognized that there was this need for, uh, to help men with facial injuries. Nobody was doing it. And so when Harold Gillies gets over to France as an ENT specialist, um, he, he meets Vladier. Vladier, because he's a dentist, he needs medical oversight, so Harold Gillies is assigned to do that oversight. But it's arguably Gillies who learns more from um, Vladier, and he recognizes that there is going to be this great need for facial reconstruction. And so you get these kinds of uh, people, but I wanted to, there, there's a young Harold Gillies, but here's a great picture of the Queen's Hospital in Sidcup. We were talking about community. and. Um, I love this image because here they all are in various states of bandages um, with their nurses and, and various people working at the hospital. And that was the other part about Gillies was it was really interdisciplinary. He brought in artists. He brought in an artist named Henry Tonks who uh, painted these beautiful portraits of these men and really gave us a, a pictorial record of the injuries at various different stages in color, which was, is very useful. Um, and he had you know, different kinds of surgeons. He worked with dentists. A lot of surgeons at this time thought dentists were below them. Dentistry was very important when you're rebuilding the face, and so that was also a really um, a fascinating part of the community, not just the community of patients, but the community of practitioners. Um, and, and so like you've mentored the MDT before. Right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and actually, speaking of artists, um, some of you will be familiar with the fictional character Richard Harrow from Boardwalk Empire who wears one of these masks. So you had these mask makers, um, women like Anna Coleman Ladd, who was this American woman who went over to Paris and opened a studio, and she created this mask, and, these masks. And whenever I post these images, in fact, I, I uh, publicize this event with one of these images, they tend to go semi-viral. People really respond positively because they can't believe how lifelike these masks are. But I always tell audiences that as wonderful as these look in black and white photos, of course, if you're sitting across from somebody wearing one, it's different. It doesn't act like a face. It doesn't age. It doesn't blush. It doesn't move. So it can be unsettling. But the most important part you need to remember about the masks is they would have been uncomfortable to wear. Imagine wearing a tin mask over an injured face. In fact, there was a patient of Gillies that would go out into London wearing one of these um, whenever he, he wanted a trip into London. And inevitably, he would come back and he would hold up one, two, three, four, or five fingers to indicate how many people had reacted negatively when he took the mask off, when it became too hot or too uncomfortable. So I remind people that as beautiful as these images are and as wonderful as the artists were who gave their talent and time to help these men, these men were not wearing the mask for themselves. They were wearing it for us so that the viewer felt comfortable to look at them. And arguably, if we could have been comfortable with their disfigurement, there would have been no need for the mask. There probably wouldn't have even really been a need for what Gillies was doing, except to maybe restore function, like the ability to speak or eat. But going far beyond that, I mean, we're talking some of these patients spent years, literally years, um, in, in surgery and doing undergoing painful procedures. So a lot of it was, was driven by that bias. And this is one of Gilly's patients. Um, sometimes the surgeon got too far, or he got um, as far as he could go. So in this case, Gillies couldn't take Rifleman Moss any further, and so he had to wear the prosthetic. And so Gillies actually hated the masks because they reminded him of his own limitations as a surgeon. 
Wow. I mean, I, you know, I think it's just incredible because, you know, I think as, as humans, we're designed, you know, we've got a, something that's keep, kept us alive, um, helped us differentiate, yeah. you know, our, our tribe from, say, the other tribes. But that, that, you know, whilst that allowed the human race to kind of develop, it's now almost right. become a real hindrance. And, and a, also, you, know, you can sustain a lot of trauma to your face. I mean, that surprised me researching yeah. this, like how much trauma you can sustain I mean, I hate to kind of put it this way, but like this fleshy part, you don't really need <laughs> to survive, right? <laughs> but, so but you do, you perhaps do need for for life in the sense that you know so much right. communication is is nonverbal. Exactly, um, it's about subtle facial um, movements and things like that. And these right. these people, have but they lost could that survive ability. the initial yeah. injury. Yeah, it's incredible. Which is which is hard. <laughs> and you know, I I always I always say to audiences, what can I tell you? that, you know, you're going to a lot of events at HISFest. What can I tell you guys that will continue to haunt you for days that you're going to think about? I always like to tell that story. And so I like to tell the story, if I can, briefly, <laughs> of Private Walter Ashworth, who was injured on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And he had no jaw, and he was unable to scream for help, so he laid on a battlefield for three days. Now, you might be asking yourself, how can you lay on a battlefield for three days and nobody picks you up? But these stretcher bearers, the moment they stepped onto the battlefield, they became targets. And so they had to make life and death decisions about who got saved and who got left behind. And Jen will know this more than anyone, but the face is very vascular. So even if you have a small cut, it will bleed and bleed. It looks ghastly. Um, but a lot of times you could survive it, but these stretcher bearers didn't realize that. Um, and it's really not a surprise. This is Private Walter Ashworth shortly after he was evacuated back to Britain and fell into the hands of Harold Gillies. You might not know by looking at his photo, but he was very lucky that day because he fell forwards and not backwards, and that was key to his survival. A lot of times these men fell onto their backs and or they were placed onto their backs by well-meaning medics, and they ended up choking on their tongues because they were missing certain anatomy, or they drowned in their own blood. And it was only later in the war that the official advice came, please, dear God, place these men face down on the stretcher. And that ended up saving a lot of lives. So he was really lucky. He fell forwards. But he laid there for three days. He was lucky in another sense because he fell into the hands of Harold Gillies. But when he got to the hospital, he found out that broken faces often lead to broken hearts. And his fiance broke off their engagement. This was not uncommon. But I like to share Ashworth's story because it has a bit of a happy ending. His fiance's friend got wind of this and she began writing letters to him and soon they were visiting each other, they fell in love and they were married. When he was discharged from the hospital, he went back to work and here you can see the, the uh, progression. I think he looks great, um, especially given you know, no antibiotics, no textbooks, I think he looks great. Uh, his old boss made him work at the back of the shop so that he wouldn't frighten the customers. So not all wounds were inflicted on the battlefield. Eventually, Ashworth and his wife thought, we're moving. We're going to Australia. So they set up a new life. And many, many years later, they ran into Harold Gillies. And at this point, Gillies had grown as a reconstructive surgeon. He was delighted to see Ashworth. And as surgeons are wont to do, he asked if he could have another go at Ashworth's face. <laughs> But Ashworth said no. He had made peace with the face he had been given, and he was happy with the face he had. And so I always say that the face maker is about identity. What it, does it mean to have a face? What does it mean to lose a face, to gain a new kind of face? And you know, just how much of our identity is wrapped in our physical bodies and those prejudices that come with it, like that you faced when sometimes when patients see you and have those negative reactions. It's funny, actually, it's not patients, it's oh. fellow colleagues. Oh, <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> it's always really shocked oh, me, because I'm man. sure, you know, when you're coming for an operation and you see a doctor that's uh, perhaps not like the other doctors uh, <sighs> you've seen in the glossy uh, magazines, is... um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's really interesting. Um, that but, um, is even now. I'm more horrified yeah. by that story. So medical doctors can't. Well, uh, doctors, or nurses, yeah. paramedics. You know, uh, I, I think it's um, it, it's yeah. really interesting. One of the things that really struck me about the book is um, about some of the language that's used around disability, because you know I think it's really important when you're talking about a community that you 
take time to understand that community and, and how, how did you do that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. So the word disfigured is not a word we would necessarily use today. We might use the word facial difference. Um, I ended up working with a disability activist, an author named Ariel Henley, who wrote a fantastic book called A Face for Picasso. She has Cruzon syndrome and she calls herself disfigured. She uses that term. And it was a great uh, exercise in learning a totally different perspective because there are things that able-bodied people will say or reactions will have that are harmful that we might not even be aware of. So an example, um, in the book, I talk about how Harold Gillies banned mirrors. He didn't allow these men to look at themselves. And I originally said this was because he was trying to protect them, which he was, but Ariel said, well, I want you to think about how that also caused harm because in a way he was implying or insinuating that they had faces they should be ashamed to look at or scared to look at and that might build anxiety or make them feel more isolated. So it was that perspective. Now the term disfigured, I use that term. It's on the, the book cover. In fact, Penguin did not, they were really nervous about a lot of aspects. Um, love you, Penguin. Um, <laughs> but my editor, my, my US editor, he didn't want the photos in the book either. And I said, I have to put the photos in the book because I cannot put these men on the blue bench in 20, 22, when the book came out, they have to be seen. We have to grapple with what war does. We're seeing the return of trench warfare in places like Ukraine. So we, we need to look at their faces. But um, I, with Ariel's uh, you know, conversation with Ariel on this, we both agreed that disfigured was appropriate because these men were disfigured to the people of their time. And calling them anything else would have lessened that experience. I mean, these were, like I said, this was a time when losing a face made you a monster. And that's really their lived experience. So I did think about that language. And you know, we talk about the disability community. We were joking backstage because I, you know, the disability community, it's not a monolith. Like every, you know, there's disagreement within the disability community and we can have these conversations. For me, I had never um, engaged with a disability activist. I felt that was a really important process when writing this book and it was brilliant. She really helped make this story a lot better by helping me see perspectives that I might have missed otherwise just as a straight up medical historian. Yeah, so. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's incredible. I think it's very, the language that you've used in the book is very careful, it's very considered, and it's it's something as, as me reading the book, I'd never even thought that you'd put right. so much thought into it, but I think that's the magic of the book, isn't it? Yeah, and then also the photos, you know, we talked about that, like what do we show, what do we not show, and, and like I said, the, the decision with Lum was to show his pre-injury photo and a, a surgical diagram of what Gillies was ultimately trying to do. I didn't think it was right to show him because he couldn't complete his reconstructive process. There are, there might be people in the audience who know of a, a video game called Bioshock. Does anybody know this video game? Okay, Bioshock. I, I've, I'm not going to talk extensively on this, but Bioshock is a game, I think it came out like at least 10 years ago, and they used Gilly's patient's images to create like monstrous figures in the game. Um, now, there are people who have come to me who say, I learned a little bit about Gilly's existence through Bioshock, but the, the fact of the matter is they use these images to other these men who, by the way, had no say in whether their images would be used like this. So I'm always very aware too when I speak to audiences when I'm showing Ashworth, this is why I say please no photos because you don't want this floating around on the internet without context. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Gillies, uh, you know, there, there are images of his patients out there um, without context and there's not much we can do about it. But that's, that's the problem is, um, so for me, I wanted to make sure I was showing these men because I think it's important, but I was doing it in a way that was respectful because when their photos were taken, he could, Ashworth couldn't imagine, you know, somebody named Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris coming and writing a book called The Face Maker, you know. I mean, there's, there was really no I, concept of, you know, consent in that way. And even the portraits that Henry Tonks paints, um, which I do not include in the book only because the publisher said that they, they would only um, include them in black and white. And I felt like, I'm married to an artist, and I felt like, no, they should be shown in color. I didn't want to put them in black and white. 
Um, but he, Henry Tonks, he never imagined that these, these paintings would ever really be seen in the way that they now are exhibited in museums and the way that we interact with this material. So, so yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I haven't seen many Hollywood, Hollywood um, heroines or heroes with no. um, any sort of disfigurement. No. It's usually the villains. It's, I mean, all, I mean think know. about it, Darth Vader, Voldemort, all of the Bond villains. Yeah. Um, I mean, the list the goes Joker. on. The Joker, yeah. Um, and even like the penguin, I got, I don't know what, what is the penguin? Is he, I don't know what that is, but I feel like there's, there's something problematic there. Um, but the list goes on and on. I'm trying, there's a, there's a really, I'm not gonna say his name, but there's a really wonderful director um, in Australia and he's won a lot of awards and he wants to make this into a film, but we've come across some roadblocks and one of them is that we approached a production company a really great one, they were very excited about this, but then they got nervous because they didn't want to fall, they said they didn't want to come down on the wrong side of representation. So the, the thing is Hollywood thinks, okay, representation should be on screen, but then they're scared to do it because they're worried, oh, what if we do it wrong? Instead of having the difficult conversation, like this director wants to bring in uh, disfigured actors as, as extras, and so there there's a way to do that representation um, so I guess their solution, this production company's solution is don't do it at all because it's too hard to do it in a way that we might not be criticized. So these are the, the you know, barriers to telling the face maker. And even when the book came out, there were so many reviews, uh, there were great reviews. And I was always oh, so excited, you know, Wall Street Journal, none of them ran photos of the men. They always ran photos of me, which was worse. I was like, don't put the photo of me up, you know, put the photo. But um, the, the, the guy um, who reviewed it in the Wall Street Journal, he wrote a book called Manhunt, which is now on Apple. I don't know if anybody's been watching that. And he came to my book event in DC and he said, I tried to get them to put the photos in and they agreed. And then the night before they pulled it. So they, they wouldn't put up the photos in the newspaper. So we're, we still have a lot to overcome, I think, when it comes to that. Um, but actually, as we're, I'm gonna flip through, there's, there's a lot of uh, patient photos. Um, this man uh, receives the first two pedicle, which is a huge achievement in plastic surgery with Gillies, and you can see that flap there. It's how he reconstructs the face, and he was terribly burned, and he had no eyelids, and so this really haunted Gillies, and he, he was trying to figure out how to rebuild the eyelids, because this man couldn't even close his eyes to the horror he had seen during the Battle of Jutland, so he's in the book. You're gonna have to bear with me. I'm gonna actually just go through these very quickly. I didn't know what I was gonna end up showing you guys, but I just wanna say to a about word the about the cover. <laughs> yeah. I know, because Jen and I are talking. I always, I don't know how many people actually even care about this part of the conversation, but I'm such a writing nerd. I like to like kind of know what happens when you publish a book. One of the things that happens is you don't have much control over a lot of things as the author. Now, the US, um, this is the US cover that my husband designed, but the original cover that the US publisher designed was terrible. I mean, it was so bad. It looked like a puzzle book that you would give your granny. It didn't convey anything that I wanted. I was like, this is the worst cover. And, um, and so I told them, you know, you're gonna have to redo this cover. And they, they sort of panicked and they said, well, what do you have as an idea? Well, here, this is a little bit of an Easter egg for people who know Gilly's work. You see in that corner is uh, the, the cover of Harold Gilly's uh, book on plastic surgery, and it's a photo of his hands holding the scalpel. And so what my husband did was kind of turn it on its end where you still have that scalpel in the surgeon's hand, but in the reflection is the banded soldier. And although it's called a face maker, it's really about you know many men, many of Gilly's patients as well. Um, the, I loved the UK cover, Penguin actually nailed that right off the bat, that's the middle cover there. Um, it's just evocative and kind of disturbing. I, I hope it gets people to, to stop in a, in a bookshop. And then you see the Polish cover and, and various other foreign translations. But it's a weird, the face maker, I didn't have a title until the very, very end. Um, I was really panicking. I didn't want it to be, you know, like the faceless war. I, you know, I didn't want it to be something dumb like that. So I, I came across a letter written to Harold Gillies when he was knighted and it said, Dear Face Maker. And I thought, oh, it's perfect, you know. So I, I talk about that in the epilogue. And I, I, know, I know we're, we're kind of winding, but I just wanted to also, because we had talked about this, Jen, one other thing about Harold Gillies is he performs the first phalloplasty on a trans man in the 1940s, a trans man named Michael Dillon. 
Um, and he's really well placed to do this because during the Second World War, he was working on soldiers who were getting injuries to the genital area, so he, he knew how to do this to some extent. Um, Michael Dillon is outed by the British press a few years later. He's driven from Britain um, because of the media frenzy. But Harold Gillies stood by him and saw him as a man. And so, like I said, this is a book about identity. And Gillies really believes that people should control their identities, whatever that be. You know, whether that be, you know, facial reconstruction, even cosmetic surgery, he moved into that realm. He felt that if you were unhappy with something, you should be able to control and change that about yourself. Which, so for me, he was genuinely a hero. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I really love about this book is that it doesn't just write, you could, it would be easy to see it through the war lens and just write about um, his time at Sidcup and, and, yeah. and, you know, the prime. But I, I also feel that you then bring in, actually, you know, life is about ups and downs, about, right. you know, and yeah. you having to sort of slightly reinvent yourself because you were saying that... Um, you know, he had to um, had to earn a living. It's this is pre-NHS. Yes, yeah, um, you know, yeah there was is, no plastic yeah. surgery. Well, so Jen listened to the audiobook. Um, I don't know. Has anybody listened to the audio of Face Maker? Everybody's like, nobody's read this book here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll just say one thing about the audiobook. It's narrated by a, an actor named Daniel Gillies, who's in the Vampire Diaries and the originals, and he happens to be the great great nephew of Harold Gillies. And I joked to him on Twitter, "You should do the book." And he said, okay, <laughs> and I was very happy about that. And um, it, it's been really fun because as he was recording it, of course he's known about Harold Gillies, but not to the extent that the book kind of shines that light. So he was, I, I, they told me that when he was recording, he would stop and say, oh, I, I didn't know that. Um, but he did say that one of the things he remembers as a child is kind of the stories about the post-war Gillies trying to convince people, you know, that he could, he could fix that nose for you or whatever, you know, trying to like kind of make money because plastic surgery just didn't exist in any kind of form. Um, so there is this whole other, you know, push to move and expand and, and move into a different realm. And then of course the Second World War happens and Gilly's cousin, um, Archibald McIndoe, who becomes very famous for operating on the guinea pig club um, in the Second World War, who were these burned pilots. And there's a letter I came across from a soldier in the First World War who said, the guinea pig club, we were the guinea pigs, you know. <laughs> we were the ones who really were the guinea pigs. Um, and there's, I think there's an argument to be made, but British audiences always are very familiar with the guinea pig club. So I always say that the face maker is the prequel to the guinea pig club. And really, Gillies was the first to do it. And he's the one who teaches and introduces his cousin to the strange art of plastic surgery. And that's what leads to the reconstructive uh, constructive surgery of the guinea pig club. It's amazing, isn't it? Well, before we open um, the floor to questions, I, I'd love to know, is there anything that you haven't put in the book that you wish that you had? There's nothing I, I you know, I mean, that's, that's a really great question. And, and usually people don't ask that because a lot of what I feel my job is, is, is getting rid of stuff mm -hmm. because I mean when you talk about World War One, there's so much material. I mean it's it's outrageous. And the other thing was that I never ventured in the 20th century, and I had stupidly not considered what this meant. Which it meant that things were in copyright. I had to prove that these men were dead in some cases to get their medical files. I mean, can you imagine? And there's still patient confidentiality. So, for instance, Gillies wrote about these men with their names. In, in many instances, he published about them. That's all fine to use. Now, if I went into their case notes and I found something that he hadn't included in his publication, I couldn't use that in relation with that man's name. So it was very complicated in that sense. Um, there wasn't anything I left out that I wish I had put in, but that is one of the biggest challenges, is just making that, you know, I'm trying to convince people to pick up a book about plastic surgery in the First World War, and my primary publisher is American, so I, I go over and do American tour, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, Americans barely know anything about World War I, and I have to get them to pick up a book about plastic surgery, World War I, but I was so excited because the book did hit the New York Times bestseller, which was, for me, was like a really big goal, but the bigger part was I was, I was so happy that Gillies and his patients were getting that story out in a big way, that people were talking about his work and, and these soldiers as well, and that brought a lot of joy. Um, 
But yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's slim, so it's not going to take you much time <laughs> to get through. I never write huge books. You know, you come into a bookstore and you're like, oh my gosh, there's like a biography on John Adams and it's like that big. That to me, and I'm a historian, to me that's, that's like a little off-putting, so I always like to try to keep everything really slim. I write narrative nonfiction, which means it reads like a novel if I've done my job right. It's, so hopefully it's, it's entertaining. I mean, you know, in that I, sense. I, it, I, once I started, that, I couldn't finish <laughs> yeah. it. So, uh, you know, I couldn't recommend it more. Thank you so much. Um, we open up to yet. questions. Oh, right, right there. Oh, they're bringing the microphone. Um, obviously, this is like very early stages, so you might not have been able to. But was there an attempt to get photos of them pre-injury to try and match the surgery to what they would have looked like? Or was it very much just yeah. do what you can do That's with such what a you've good got? Question. I, that, I have, you know, also, I have to say, I was telling Jen, I was a little bit nervous about doing event because it's been a while since I've written the book. And I have not done many book events because right after I came back from the US and I was riding high on the New York Times, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I had to stop everything and I'm fine and I got through my treatment, but it's just been a roller coaster. So I haven't, and then I worry that I'm gonna forget things. Cause you know, you do, you forget. Like it's been a few years since I've written it. But that it's not a question I've actually gotten. Um, and it, and it reminded me that yes, Gillies would sometimes um, ask these men for pre-injury photos. Sometimes, but he would say, "Do you want that nose?" You know, and so he would show them like his like like little book of noses, and he said, "Well, what do you feel like having?" So he didn't necessarily aim to replicate their pre-injury face unless they wanted that. Um, but he he was happy to you know go with whatever they sort of wanted. So yeah, great question. And, and by the way, I think with the mask, though, they did try to replicate. They worked from, yeah, the photos of what the men used to look like. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I find uh, the cover of um, the one on the right quite interesting. That's the Dutch one. Yes, that's, yeah. It's a Dutch one. It's and very uh, haunting, isn't it? Yes, and it's, it either translates to the face or the view of the First World War, so a, a quite a different title than Face right. Maker. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if I really have a direct question about it. It just really strikes me as I a, love that cover, too. As, as a bit of an odd cover. I mean, it's, it's very, yeah. it yeah. really grabs the attention, but... It feels, it, it, it feels like it captures the loss, too, of a generation of men who kind of disappeared. Yeah, because it's, it's an invisible man. Right. Whereas with their facial disfigurement, they would be both invisible, invisible. yet also Very, incredibly yes. visible yeah. to the right. public view. No, that is, a, that is a very good point. I mean, I, like I said, I have so little say. I mean, you, you wouldn't believe, you know, you have to fight for titles. I remember, and w with The Face Maker, I, I, I have a friend named Eric Larson. If you've never read Eric Larson's books, get on it, because he's an amazing writer. Um, he wrote Devil in the White City and lots of fantastic books. And I always kind of like look to him, because he's just so good at what he does. And I kept throwing titles at him. And then when I threw The Face Maker at him, he said, that's the title, that's a bestseller, don't let them change it. But they will try to change it on you. And so, and, but with the translations, you know, of course, yeah, the face maker, how do you tr translate it? So in this case, in the Polish edition, they didn't, you know, you can't translate it. Um, but it is always interesting how these covers get interpreted. And, and, and oh, by the way, the reason why there are different covers is because they're different publishers. So if the publisher in the UK, for instance, wanted the US cover, they would have to pay for the rights. So it's kind of like they're cheap. They're like, oh, we'll just create our own cover. But there's also an aspect of, you know, British uh, audience might have different sensibilities than an American, you know, so they try to, you know, mold it to the market, so. Wow, this is a world I just didn't yeah. understand. This is yeah. a... Yeah. I know, I know. This is, what, this is like the nerdy things I like yeah. to share about publishing. Thanks so much for the talk. It's been yeah. fascinating. Um, I was just going to ask, you'd mentioned there was an international sort of rivalry um, in the hospital. Yes. Were there any sort of rivals to Howard Gillies who kind of were his main rival? Oh, yeah, there is... Medicine loves... Yeah, them, they right? love a rival. <laughs> there is, there's a guy I talk about in The Face Maker um, who, who works with Gillies. Um, <laughs> But he gets very uh, angry later on, saying that he came up with the tubed pedicle, and there's like this big fight in the Lancet, you know, because that's how doctors fight. They <laughs> put it on, put it in words, and put it in the in the medical journals. And um, and he and this this man felt very aggrieved um, that that he had 
um, essentially not been credited. But if you look at the case notes, there's no way that it wasn't Gillies. But I also talk about how this tubed pedicle was independently also uh, being uh, discovered by a Russian surgeon separately. So I, it's not to me, it's not. Um, it's not revolutionary, it's evolutionary. So it was out of this great need. So surgeons were kind of figuring this out. Essentially what the tube pedicle was like, they used to move flaps of skin and keep the underside open. What he did was he rolled it so that the skin was encased and that way he could move these, these like, fle like fleshy trunks of skin. Um, so he might raise a, a tubed pedicle from the thigh, move it here, and then when it attached here, he would sever it here and then flip it up and move it up to the chest and so forth and so on until it got to the face. Um, but there were other surgeons certainly who were doing similar things. So, oops, lots of questions, <laughs> great. Tucked in the back. This man right here. Sorry, Rebecca. It's okay. It's okay. This is when you really work yeah. for, your <laughs> for your meal here. <laughs> Well, firstly, thank you very much. I did read the book last year. I'm also an anaesthetist, long since retired. I worked at East Grinstead oh, with the yes, guinea pigs, right. where we still use two pedicle grafts until microvascular surgery. Wow. But I think the most interesting thing is when you see the picture of the four major plastic surgeons, including Gillies, Mackindo, Rainsford, Molim, and, and then Kelsey Fry, who was really a dentist. Yes, yes, that's right. And I say to people, what's, who's the odd one out? Well, Kelsey was a dentist, but all the other three were New Zealanders. So yes, three out of right, four yeah. were New Zealanders. And I think also you mentioned Sir Ivan McGill, but there's a wonderful interview with Cyril Skur, who was a senior uh, uh, anaesthetist at, at Westminster Hospital, where McGill was, a, of course, a professor, mm. about how he, his training in anaesthesia in Belfast, he had to anaesthetize one patient before he became a general practitioner. Oh my who gosh, gave really, all the that's anaesthetic. it. <laughs> and then he talks about how he invented wow. the tube. Yeah, rolling, you know these rubber tubes and so yep, on. It's absolutely yeah. fascinating if you like that sort of thing. I mean, he, I, I, <laughs> I would, I would love to attempt a book about him, but it is so complicated. I had to, I had multiple specialist readers check my work, and also, um, I was telling Jen that when you read Gilly's case notes, it's like he's describing making toast in the way that he. <laughs> You know, if I was telling you how to make toast, I'm going to leave out a few steps because I know you guys are going to know, get the bread out of the, you know. So he was leaving things out because he assumed a prior knowledge. Of course, I don't have any medical knowledge. Um, and then my husband is a caricaturist. This is really weird. He's a caricaturist for spinning image. So he's really good at faces. And he would read the case notes and he would, write, he would draw it for me and what was happening with the face, um, which was really helpful. But it was, you know, Ivan McGill, uh, he, he deserves also the big book, but um, anesthesia is very complicated. <laughs> I don't know if I want to get into that. Um, my next book is called Sleuth Hound, and it's, um, I'm still writing it, but it's about a guy named Joseph Bell who was the real-life Sherlock Holmes. So I'm going back into the 19th century where I don't have to worry about copyright and patient confidentiality, <laughs> uh, but it should be a, a, fun, a fun romp through Victorian forensics. Any, oh, and we have online, do we have any online? Yeah. Yep, so coming in from our online audience, um, Sarah has asked, how long was your research process and do you remember any highlight moments in discoveries that you made? My research process, it, was, it took way too long. I mean, commercially speaking, I'm, it's, you know, I'm entirely a freelance writer, so they like those books to come out you know, as quickly as possible, unfortunately. This took five years between the butchering art and the face maker coming out. And a lot of it I was writing during the pandemic, so it was incredibly lonely experience. At one point, my husband um, went outside to take the trash out, and he the trash can fell on his hand. This like really dramatic, like his hand was all. And I thought, oh no, an artist, you know. And so we called the paramedics, and they come. Now our house is full of caricatures, and then I, and he was laying on the bed, and there was all the patient photos and these paramedics were like what is this house like what do you guys do you know and i said but but he's right here help him and they're like but what what <laughs> what is all of this so um so yeah it was it was a really long process and you know they always say that art is never finished just abandoned um and and that's really what you have to do with a book you know you can go back and you think oh i wish maybe i had done this differently but you can never you can never do it and you just have to kind of at some point let go and put it out there and hope that people will 
will like it and, and the critics will be nice about it, so. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes? Hi. Uh, I've been um, looking into archaeological facial reconstruction and I've actually been on your trail. I've been to lots of places oh. that you've been for your research. Oh, amazing. Um, but I wanted to just ask you more about the historical injuries or punishments where people have had their eyes, that, not their eyes, well, their eyes put out yeah. or their yeah. noses cut off and the, the historical reconstruction right. attempts in the past. Yeah, I mean, there were there was some, I mean, rhinoplasty is certainly one of the oldest uh, medical procedures, you know, documented. The term plastic surgery is coined in 1798. At the time, plastic means something that you can shape or mold. So in this, this case, a patient's skin or soft tissue. But these early attempts um, were really confined to very small areas, and they weren't very good. You get um, sort of an attempt at doing bigger reconstruction during the American Civil War, um, and I had put up a slide here, but it, ne it didn't look good, um, and there was good reason for that, because at this point, American surgeons didn't accept germ theory. If you want that story, my first book, The Butchering Art, I, I got to plug my books when I can. <laughs> um, but they didn't believe Joseph Lister in germ theory. And so the infection rates were quite high. So they really were getting in, getting out as quickly as they can, restoring function. It was under Gillies where they suddenly realized that something that looked typical also tends to function better. So if your nose is in the right place, it's probably going to function better. And then the other difference was that there were very few of these operations going on in the Civil War. There's, there, I think there was something like 40 in total. So, and then when you go back even further, you know, this is, this is a time when not only did they not want to mess with the face per se because of the infection rates and the risk, but there was a sense that you were hiding your wickedness. Um, there was a social stigma attached with the diseases that destroyed the face or the crimes. And so people actually were very suspicious of reconstructive surgery, that it was somehow kind of going against God's will, that it was God's will that you were supposed to look this way as a sign of your, you know, moral failings. So, um, you know, there were attempts, but I, I didn't deal with a lot of that early stuff except to just kind of mention the social stigma. But that's fascinating. You got to write the, the prequel to the prequel <laughs> on plastic surgery. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I wanted, so I actually came into Gillies because of the sex assignment uh, right. surgery, so that's how I knew about him first. I'm just wondering, is there any inklings of him working on this in either the First World War or the pre-Second World War before he gets With into the- With the gender uh, yeah. uh, affirmation? Um, yeah. My friend Brandy Shalotsky is writing a book on the Nazi, um, cl the clinic that the Nazis destroyed in Berlin um, in the 1930s. So she's kind of taking this story and running with it as well. Um, but, you know, it was, for me, I, I, I had to mention it in the book because it's a huge part of Gilly's story. Um, but because I write narrative nonfiction and I write these kind of gritty uh, well, narratives, basically, I, I, I couldn't get all the way to World War II because then I had to go through World War I, World War II to get to Michael Dillon. So he's really in the epilogue. But I um, talked to... Uh, a trans man when I was writing it to check the language and we talked about this and it, I'm really glad that Michael Dillon's in the book and I like that people um, are interested in his story. I could have spent, you know, a whole book on, on just his story alone. Um, but yes, Brandy Shlotsky, if you follow me on Twitter, you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, I'm always plugging her stuff so you'll come across it. That book's probably coming out next year. So there are, that's on the horizon. That's definitely being worked on by medical historians. Amazing. Thank you. questions yeah. back there, yeah. Hi, thank you for an excellent talk, by the way. Um, would you say that personally, given our vanity culture and the fact that disability rights activists are pretty much a new concept, mm. would you say your own perception of plastic surgery and what it means for us now has changed since writing the book? That's a really good question. I, You know, people, I was saying to Jen that people in interviews always want to get me to to say, to make a moral judgment on what plastic surgery has become today. 
I do remind audiences that if you think of plastic surgery as like a heading, underneath you have reconstructive and you have cosmetics. So that all still makes up plastic surgery. And there are a lot of surgeons who do reconstructive surgery. There are a lot of surgeons who just do cosmetics. Some of them do both. Gillies did, as I said, move into the cosmetic realm. Um, he did grapple, I think, a little bit at the beginning. He wondered if this was you know, ethical, but then he felt that if people were unhappy with something, they should be able to control it. I do think that today we are hyper aware of how we look, you know? Um, and part of that is driven by the plastic surgery culture. And of course, with social media, there, it's targeted towards younger and younger people. We were joking about how we're old enough to remember when thin eyebrows were in, <laughs> and how like, the eyebrows have changed. Now they're much thicker. So the problem is with plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, is if you're changing something, you can't be sure that, that it's not just a trend. That some, you know, the body, the ideal beauty today is very different to what it was 20 years ago, which was different to what it was 20 years before that. So I, that's always my caution to people if you're thinking about changing something you know you got to have you got to really think about that and um, I think also you know psychologically I went through a terrible divorce in 2015 and I remember I met a plastic surgeon who um, uh, trained at Sidcup and she actually said she really doesn't operate on, on women um, who are going through divorce at the time, she always encourages them to wait. Because there's this kind of sense that you know you want to change something really quickly. And so I think that kind of thoughtful engagement, I have no problem with plastic surgery. I think people like Gillies, they should be able to control their identity. I think we just need to slow down and have those conversations with your doctor. Um, but yeah, certainly, I think he would be amazed at what plastic surgery has become. And face transplants, which I talk about in the epilogue, is sort of the final frontier um, and I met a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic who's doing these face transplants, and it's amazing. And I said, do you think this is what Gillies would be doing if he was alive today? And he said, yeah, he definitely would be doing this, because this is, this is like the new thing. So these, this is when people are severely, like they literally have lost their face. One of the uh, patients, this man at the Cleveland Clinic who I met, operated on, was a young woman who had tried to kill herself, and she had no face at, at the end, and she survived it. So he gave her a face. Um, a donor came up a few years later and he was able to do the face transplant. She's doing amazing. And so he's doing amazing work. So what we are able to do is incredible. I mean, I can't imagine what we're going to be able to do in 10, 20, you know, 50 years. So. I, think, I think as well it's also important to remember that, you know, as you said, there's the aesthetic side, but there's also the function. You, he, you know, plastic surgery gives people um, back function. That's right, um, yeah. And, um, right. you know, it's, it's, it, you can look at a situation through lots of different lenses, right. can't yeah. you? And I, I think it's really important, you know, that you, what, the way you've looked at right. Gaha, well, giving yeah. us a view of Harrigan yeah. is, is through a, a beautiful lens that sees all of the work he does rather than just one bit in isolation. It would be like remembering Alfred Nobel for right. TNT rather than actually creating yeah. a, um, you know. I only remember amazing. that. No, I <laughs> no. no but it's, you know, it's well, true. Yeah, I mean, the function part is right. I mean, there, there are sometimes, you know, it's, I mean, looking at this man here from the Civil War, like clearly he was not going to be able to live like this. So they were really, I don't know how he lived in the final either. Quite frankly, that was, you know. His, it doesn't look like he has much of a mouth, but they clearly were trying to get him to a, a, a stage where he had some kind of mouth that he could breathe better. So yes, the function is always part of that. But I mean, it would be, for, for me, it would be wrong to, to characterize Gillies as only interested in that. He definitely wanted to make it look good, and he liked that challenge, and he moved into the cosmetic realm too. But yeah, I think, I think, I think he'd be surprised at how big business plastic surgery has become. Um, but he would also be excited by some of the things that we can do and the ways that we can address uh, patient concerns, um, and and again about changing, you know, controlling your identity. I think that would excite him and, and make him proud of what plastic surgery is. Yes. Um, I, yeah. Thank you for that talk because I think as a teacher, um, this will really help me convey the humanity with the students and get them to really understand when we teach about uh, medicine in the Western Front oh. and looking through the patients and the diaries. I think that would be great. Uh, my question is. Between Joseph Lister oh, no. and, <laughs> oh, and Gillies, who is your favorite to research and who do you think has the most lasting impact? Oh, 
<laughs> Choosing your babies. Um, I mean, Joseph Lister was this straight up Victorian. He was, he didn't have much of a personality. He was this Quaker, but he does this. <laughs> Sorry if there's Quakers in the audience, but you know, in the Victorian period, the Quakers were not known for their like fun and <laughs> fun and games. And in fact, in his, his Harold Gillies was known for his fun. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And Harold Gillies was like this prankster, and he he was a, a semi-professional golf player. He has this really dynamic sort of life, and um, you get a sense of a, a real person. I think if they make a movie, you're going to get this real sense of a, of a personality there. Whereas with Lister, it's really about this this thing he does. Um, Lister, his Quakerism actually is very important to what he does because his father, the Quakers at the time were not allowed to dance or listen to music. And so as a result, they were allowed to pursue scientific research. And his father um, you know, uses the microscope, teaches young Lister to do this. And so this all becomes part of his story. And I love Lister's story. I think, I always say that Joseph Lister saved more lives than any other person who ever lived. Because if you just extrapolate and you think about what we can do, Lister, without Lister, there could be no Gillies. So I think Lister ha wins in that sense. Lister actually weirdly become, creates a problem for Gillies in the First World War because what happens is the new generation of surgeons are, are uh, trained as aseptic surgeons. So they're not used to seeing infections. And when the First World War first starts, they, they don't know how to identify or react quickly enough. And sometimes with the face, they were hastily stitching up these wounds. And so they were literally sealing these men's fate in because they were sealing that bacteria in. And so Gillies would have to unpick all of this when, the, when they got to the hospital. So it, like I wrote about this in The Face Maker. I'm like, wow, this plot twist where Lister kind of becomes like, creates like this problem for, for Gillies. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love Lister's story. I can't believe that that's not, you know, a, I, I wrote that book and I thought, well, surely somebody had written this book. And I, I felt really lucky that nobody had done, you know, a big kind of commercial book about Lister. And I'm really looking forward to Joseph Bell because Joseph Bell works with Lister, like everybody in Edinburgh, they're all, it was like at the, in the 19th century, it was like all, anybody who was anybody in, in medicine was sort of up there. And um, this this great um, character who you know can look out into an audience and tell you everything about you by just looking at you, and he just had this fabulous kind of trick. So that's going to be really fun. But I'm always looking for for new stories, so you never know who's going to be <laughs> who's going to be wait. the next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank I you for that. Have question. We got time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered um, at the Queen's Hospital Sig Cup. Did the like men patients there also receive like mental health support or um, any treatment for in, for mental health? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. I, there wasn't it, it wasn't treatment for mental health per se, but I think that Gillies, the way that they created that community, there was a sense of addressing the depression that they might be suffering. There are stories, you know, when I tell Ashworth's story. I also tell the story of a, of a man named Corporal X. We don't know his name, but what happened was he, had, he, he got into the hospital, he was fully bandaged, and he kept talking about his fiance, Molly, and oh, we, I have to get these bandages off so I can see Molly. And then one day, he, he snuck a, a shaving mirror in, and he sees his face after they've unbandaged un it. And he becomes very depressed. And the nurse says, well, why don't you call Molly and have her come visit? And um, he says, no, I'll, I'll never see her again. And he ends up telling Molly that he had met a woman in France. He lies to her. He breaks off the relationship. And he ended up living sort of a recluse life. And so you know, that story is important, too, because even when Gillies was working on these men, sometimes they didn't recover psychologically. There was somebody who came to one of my events that said their grandfather or great grand it must have been their great grandfather, um, was operated on by Gillies, but he never recovered really from the shock of what had happened, and he just lived kind of this life of a hermit. Um, and and it's, it's important to say that not everybody was a success story. And of course, psychologically, not everybody could adjust to their new life. Um, I try to balance that. But it, I think, it, it, and it also, I think it's really important, especially when talking about disfigurement and the face maker, to show joy. These men, Ashworth had a very fulfilling life, so fulfilling that he didn't want his face changed in the end. 
Um, you know, so there, that's really important part of, of the representation too, is the joy that these men had and that it wasn't a fate worse than death, that they could live these fulfilling, wonderful lives after what had happened to them. Oh, I think that I think they're cutting us off. I told you they were going to cut us off. <laughs> so, well, well, thank you guys for coming. <laughs>